Hi, this is Kirby Summers. It is uh, February 3rd, uh, Thursday, and um, it's for the Epstein Project podcast. I'm going to um, sort of give you some of the happenings that were going on before my interview with uh, Professor Hamamoto. Um, there was a lot that happened, and I want to uh, recap the information on Epstein. I want to also give you additional information on Epstein and um, sort of tell you what I'm working on. So um, a lot of people have already listened. I'm kind of surprised because um, his show, uh, her, uh, uh, Professor Hamamoto, who has been gracious enough to have me on his show two times, and he sort of found me via my book, The Billionaire's Woman, which is a memoir. Um, and that's really how we connected. He put out a sort of like a call to his audience and said, hey, does anybody here know Kirby Summers? And if you do, tell her to contact me. And somebody came over to my um, YouTube channel and left me a message. I'm going to have to find that message so I can thank that person and said, hey, Professor Hamamoto, uh, you know, sort of thinks like you when he wants to talk to you. And anyway, that's sort of how that began. Um, when we scheduled um, the interview with my new information on Jeffrey Epstein, and I see that my notes are, it, it really, this is really fascinating that whenever I'm going to um, do a presentation, my, the notes that I put on a Word document uh, I can't see them, you know, sort of like there is, there is interference. So it does not surprise me that there's interference, but um, nevertheless, uh, I'm going to continue uh, because a lot of this stuff is stuff that I have. Um, it's amazing. I, my computer, uh, this note, I cannot read it. All right. <sighs> You see, that's what happens when you try to expose uh, covert programs that you're not supposed to know about. So in any event, um, when I was sort of looking at the promotional material that uh, Professor Hamamoto had been putting up on his Patreon, um, I noticed one of the photographs that were stolen from my Facebook page. And frankly, it's, it's the photograph that he used uh, as a screen image during uh, Sunday's um, podcast. Uh, but I was very surprised that he had it. And um, I, I kind of went to his link, I'm sorry, to his Patreon page and I saw that he had that and he said had some other things. And although I'm not a member, I do urge you to support his work. It's, it's obviously very important. And many of you are already supporting me uh, you're buying my books, you're becoming a member of the Epstein Project newsletter, which is really where I break all the news. All the stuff that I discover is first given to uh, the paid members of my newsletter. I no longer do a free newsletter, by the way. I, I send uh, snippets of information that are then expanded upon in my paid newsletter. Uh, because I noticed that a lot of people on the other side uh, were on my list. And my list uh, is up thousands of people at this point of my unpaid letter. And since I don't know who's getting it, I had to kind of change it up and make it just paid. So many of you have joined and become paid members, and I want to thank you for doing that. Um, you get the news first. Mainstream media is not doing it, obviously, nor will they ever do it um, for reasons that I made very clear uh, during my conversation on Sunday that many of you have listened to. And I thank you again for doing that. So before, you know, so I was a little surprised. And so on, uh, before I previewed on Sunday, I sent him a, a, an email uh, and I'm like, how did you get these photos? These, and you know, I went on and I told him, you know, I, I'm being severely trolled. Um, there are fake websites of me. These people have gone in 
and stolen images that, you know, you can't just go into somebody's Facebook page and steal their likeness and post it everywhere. But that's what's happened to me. Um, and we all know that there is uh, an Epstein victim that has been prominently helping uh, trolls to attack me. And she has been removed from the internet, uh, at least from Twitter, and I think also from other, uh, other social media because of the intense harassment aimed in my direction. And I don't know where that stems from. I don't know if it was her or her attorneys, uh, but clearly the, the reason that I have been so heavily trolled is because uh, the story of Jeffrey Epstein and Galen Maxwell, as told by mainstream media, uh, is, is not uh, the truth. If they focus narrowly on, oh, you know, the um, assaults and focus narrowly on the court cases, the who he was and how he came to be is never going to be disclosed. You know, I want to remind everyone who is listening that Alexander Acosta said during the time that he was being confirmed uh, to um, become the Secretary of Labor uh, for the United States uh, on behalf of Donald Trump. Um, and, and, you know, they did question him about uh, his role in the Jeffrey Epstein case. And that's really when he said that he had been told to back off because Epstein belonged to intelligence. So in any event, um, I was kind of really upset. I didn't understand, you know, you have to sort of, when you're in my position, uh, trolled and attacked for a good three decades. Uh, I didn't understand the night before the interview with uh, Professor Hamamoto aired, if he was on my side, if he was on their side, how he had gotten my photographs that were stolen. Was he part of it? Was, is he not? You know, I just, I needed some clarification. Uh, and so I emailed him and um, I said, you know, I need for you to take down from your Patreon these stolen images and where did you get them? And so eventually he and I straightened it out. Um, he offered to pull the interview entirely. And, you know, I had spent um, almost three hours speaking with him. I broke down several times during that conversation. It was difficult. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, it was the, the most informative, I think, of all of the interviews I have given, but it was also the most difficult to do. And I had spent days uh, compiling my information in such a way that it would make sense to you guys when you were listening. So eventually I was like, no, 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 you know, you know, go on with the, go on and air it because, you know, of what I just said. Um, but you know, during the course of the um, interview itself, he does ask me a question that almost threw me off. And at that moment, I had to make a decision. Do I continue speaking with him or do I end this conversation? Because once again, it was like a red flag to me. He wanted to know the status of my, my of, I think it was my bathtub. So that's again information from many years ago when I was having issues with my apartment that I've taken care of years ago again. Um, that was taken off of my uh, one of my social media accounts. And the reason I had social media accounts uh, to just give you some insight is because um, all of my online presence had been deleted, removed, you know all of the work I had done during Hurricane Katrina pro bono for three years with, at, at one point, uh, my volunteers mushroomed to 500 across the country. Um, I was in a lot of mainstream media. All of that um, was scrubbed. Um, I won a beauty contest, that was scrubbed. I have been in mainstream media from the time I was really 17, all of that stuff was scrubbed. My LinkedIn page was scrubbed. Everything had been scrubbed. And so, and this happened, I don't even know, it happened a long time ago. But, um, you know, I, uh, 
I felt it was a threat because I felt that if my main, my, my, my online presence was gone, the next thing that was going to be gone was going to be me because already I'd had um, attempts on my life. And so it was, it, I, I intentionally, anything that is online, I put it there. And I put it there to leave a record. I put it there to leave a record because yes, my landlord is connected to the Epstein problem, is connected to Trump, is connected to Ira Rickless. Um, they're connected to Meyer Lansky. They're connected to Bernie Kornfeld. It's all one big, um, it's, it's, it's a pot, it's a stew. And it's not a good stew because it's all connected to a covert uh, program uh, that, well, there, there are many, but among the ones that I discussed with um, Professor Hamamoto was the MK Ultra program. So while we were talking, he, you know, he, he was like, well, how's your bathtub? And at that moment, I was like, that's information that has been lurking around in fake websites uh, in an attempt to uh, assassinate my character. Now, all of you are now very, very well uh, versed in the intelligence agencies and what they do to try to keep somebody um, from being heard, and that is to assassinate their character, to do it in such a way that anything that person says, um, you guys don't believe. But the good thing is that you guys have become so savvy about these character assassinations. And, and we know that, let's say, in the case of Danny Casolero, um, he was out and out murdered. It was made to look like a suicide. So because of social media and the fact that we have been able to go back and forth and share information like this, everybody knows their tactics. Obviously, there are some people who fall for this and the term for that is useful idiot. The intelligence term for that is useful idiot. Events, you know, so they count on the useful idiot to continue to spread uh, disinformation and for other people who are friendly with them to then sort of like question the source. And, and that's been happening to Virginia Dufresne. Uh, that's been happening to me. Uh, Prince Andrew is suddenly coming out and is going to use uh, the, oh, well, that's a fake photograph that Virginia is showing. And, you know, I have to wonder what's going on at Reddit. And, you know, there is a, a sub uh, on Reddit for Epstein. They have about 100,000 subscribers to that sub. And I was welcome in the very beginning, I was welcome in that sub. And I, and I started to block some of the moderators from my Twitter account because they would say things that were very un odd. So I'm a very quick blocker. I, as you all know, I think I block more people than, I mean, certainly I block more people than I have following me. Um, and then at some point uh, they turned on me. But I've also noticed that they will repeat at nauseum all of the ridiculous uh, mainstream media articles that are written uh, uh, to um, discredit Virginia Dufresne. So like for me, I'm like, you know, repetition of uh, something like Virginia's photograph is fake. That doesn't deserve to be repeated at nauseum on Reddit or on Twitter or anywhere. It's like, it's a troll. It's look at it like a troll, ignore it, block it, move on. But on Reddit, they just keep repeating at nauseum all of these mainstream media sources, which we all know are long arms of the government and really not even long arms anymore. They're, they're, they are, intelligence agency connected so that then at some point someone reading it is going to start saying oh well maybe her, the photo is fake no her photo is very real this is just a disinformation campaign to try to discredit her because as we all know the trial is commencing okay well 
I digress because um, I was not going to talk necessarily too much about that. Uh, but I did want to share with you uh, very quickly what I discovered about Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein was, uh, from my research, a, a product of the MK Ultra program. Um, he did. Uh, he was identified at a very early age. Um, a lot of this can be found in uh, my book, Bill Barr, Leslie Wexner, and the CIA. And of course, you can listen to it for free on Professor Hamamoto's show. Uh, I'm going to keep expanding upon it. So in my next uh, newsletter, Epstein Project newsletter, which goes out on Tuesday, and I didn't send one this Tuesday, as I told everyone last week, because the amount of research necessary uh, to put together the information that I presented on uh, Professor Hamamoto's show on Sunday took a very long time. Uh, this information is, is you know, backbreaking. Uh, I still haven't taken any time off and I'm still not feeling well. I have been sick now for almost nine weeks, uh, but I keep going, you know. <laughs> Um, you know, I keep going because um, this is important for all of us uh, to know. It's important to get the information out. We've never had a window like this where we can sort of discuss what's going on. So in uh, 1974, um, when Seymour Hirsch was given uh, a 600 and some odd page uh, report compiled within the CIA, Family Jewels, it was called, um, outing many uh, of the covert programs where, and this is during the time that Richard Nixon is president of the United States. Jeffrey Epstein uh, was attending New York University at the time. And um, he abruptly stopped when, at the same time that Seymour Hirsch was writing the report that would be published in December of the same year. Jeffrey Epstein ends up um, being hired by Bill Barr almost immediately at, when the report sort of surfaced, which was the early part of 1974. And Bill Barr's father, Donald Barr, as you all know, was the headmaster at Dalton, uh, which is a school on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, a very prestigious school where the uh, children of the wealthiest people in New York City attend. And he's a former um, OSS uh, agent, uh, Office of St Strategic Services, which is the precursor of the CIA. And so Epstein is moved into Dalton, sort of to, I suppose, to give him cover. And, and at Dalton, he begins to um, teach math and physics. While he's at Dalton, he's already um, part of this and his behavior toward the other, the, you know, these are teenage kids at Dalton. Uh, is unusual. He attends their parties. The other students, when the story broke in 2019, after he was arrested for the second time, uh, uh, July 6th of 2019, um, the students who had gone to Dalton at the time were interviewed. And yeah, it's on mainstream media. And many of them said he was highly inappropriate he would be very flirty with the girls. Um, he was having, you know, inappropriate relationships with minor girls. Among these girls was Alan Ace Greenberg's um, daughter. And why this has not been uh, made a bigger deal about, I do not know, but um, her name is Lynn Koppel. I believe Koppel is her married name. Um, I know that I tweeted about it, um, and I may have that information in my book, uh, Jeffrey Epstein, Predator Spy. So, 
So Epstein uh, is hiding out there. Um, and and uh, the Montauk project is also moving at the same time. So the study comes out, family jewels thing comes out, which leads to the church committee hearings, which then sort of, you know, the public becomes really aware of it. The church committee tells the CIA, well, you can't have this mind control program. You have to stop. By this time, they have destroyed thousands and thousands, thousands of, of records. There were only 12 to 15 boxes left of cover letters. And um, they're like, sure, we're going to stop it. So this is all happening at the same time that Jeffrey Epstein is beginning uh, his transition from New York University. He does not graduate. He has moved into Dalton. Not, not coincidentally, Dalton is headed again by Donald Barr. Donald Barr has written a science fiction book. We all, we're, we're all aware of this. And so many people were scratching their heads uh, I think now we know that we can trace that to the MK Ultra program, where they studied um, things like aliens, UFOs, um, sex slavery. Jeffrey Epstein's favorite book when he was 12 years old was Man from O-R-G-Y. And later on, what does his private island, what is it called? It's called O-R-G-Y Island, right? Um, and what is a 12-year-old boy uh, doing? Reading a book that talks about toddler um, brothels and three-year-olds who are being um, trained to service men in an inappropriate way. And so um, that's happening. At the same time that that's happening, the Montauk project uh, begins because while the CIA tells the church committee, oh, we're not going to, we're, we're ending the program, it's ended. And so if you look at Wikipedia, it claims that the project officially ended in 1973. No, because they turned around, and by the way, it was being run by Nazi scientists. They turned around and went to the United States Navy, and I will be uploading to my Patreon today uh, a letter given to me by my brother. My brother was in the United States Navy for 20 years. Um, he's an older, I, I have, a, I come from a family uh, where my parents were married a couple of times, and so I have siblings that are old, a lot older than me, so my brother went into the Navy uh, in the 1960s during Vietnam. And so he has a letter, an old letter that he dug up and he sent me um, that, and it talks about the Philadelphia project. And I'm uploading uh, that to uh, my Patreon. Essentially uh, the Navy in this two page letter that they gave to him, maybe in the 70s, I don't know when they gave it to him, maybe in the 60s, maybe in, it looks like an old letter. Um, you know, I got a scan of it. So I haven't seen the original, but it looks like an old letter. Uh, you know, the way the old letters are, but it's on the Navy's letterhead and um, it talks about the project, but ultimately on the second page of the, you know, it's sort of like, well, you know, this is not true. So yeah, just like the government has said that the Franklin uh, child abuse case was not true, right? Just like they have now mainstream media is saying that what Alexander Acosta said about Jeffrey Epstein is quote, not true. So in the 1970s, 1975, kind of is when the Montauk project that is now that now they're the MK Ultra pro program has moved into the easternmost tip of Long Island. And they are experimenting. They have been given free reign, take as many children as you want. The number was 10,000. The project was given the ability to open other, other headquarters. So at some point, 
it was as high as 25 of them across the country. And so each one had the ability to take 10,000 children, take them any which way. You know, you can make some kind of deal with their parents, just like Epstein did with a lot of his, um, a lot of his victims. He would say, I can help you with your education, come here. And they would end up compromised uh, doing things they, they did not anticipate uh, because Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell could help them. And if they refused, well, then they were going to be punished severely, either suffer reputational damage so that they could not pursue their dreams, uh, or uh, they were told that their parents, something bad would happen, as in somebody's going to be murdered, or in some cases, I've heard that they have told the victim themselves that they would murder them, they would kill them. And in fact, that is exactly what happened at the Montauk Project. It's exactly what happened at the place where I am 100% convinced Jeffrey Epstein himself, when he was a little, little boy, Broadmoor, which is also in New York City, was, was handled. So, you know, um, I did say during the uh, interview with uh, Professor Hamamoto that his favorite book was Man from O-R-G-Y that he read at the age of 12. And he turns around in the 1980s and he tells at least one person that, or maybe two, because I spoke with someone and then someone who wrote an article for, uh, I believe it was Mother Jones, um, said that Epstein talked about the book and said, hey, if you read this book, and it's a book written in 1970, I don't have my notes in front of me because they have disappeared, clearly, <laughs> But it was written in, 19, in the 1970s when Epstein was 12 years old. And um, it's again, you know, toddler brothels, three-year-olds, terrible things happening to these three-year-olds, mind control, uh, creating, you know, uh, these uh, children that are going to be abused. Uh, and he says, uh, if you read this book, it will explain who I am. It will explain who I am. So it's really interesting because I really have not been following, uh, you know, I, I do follow the Epstein case very closely because it's connected to what happened to me and also the Franklin scandal because Ira Rickless is connected to the Franklin scandal, to the Epstein um, case, to Roy Cohn, whose partner was uh, in the uh, trafficking ring that he ran from the Plaza Hotel a Rosenteel is a partner of uh, Ira's father, Michelin Rickless. So Ira Rickless is connected to all of these um, covert child trafficking rings in so many ways that if I sat down to write them all down, I would be writing all day long. Okay, so he's connected to Roy Cohn. He's connected to the Franklin scandal through his brother-in-law. He's connected to uh, the Jeffrey Epstein case. His uh, relative was Stephen Hoffenberg's business partner. I mean, his father did business with Leslie Wexner. The connections are everywhere. What I, so that um, before I move on and, and tell you something that I, I feel happened in New York City with the Son of Sam, which again, I'm not an expert on the Son of Sam murders. I was in New York during that time. I remember that time very well. Everybody was terrified. But based on my research, I do have information I want to share with you. Before doing that, I want to say that um, the uh, program, the MK Ultra program, was funded by the CIA pre-1974 when they were sort of basically uh, cut off. The government cut them off and said, we're not helping you. You know, they were up until that point creating uh, shell corporations through which they would funnel money into uh, various schools like Harvard, psychiatric institutions, um, wherever they were going to study MKUltra covertly. It's not like they told people 
uh, like Ted Kaczynski, who studied at Harvard and he was uh, a subject, or, you know, Whitey Bulger, or, I mean, it's just, it, it, you know, and this has been happening for a very long time. I think it's much darker even than what I have discovered. And I'm pulling at those threads um, as we speak or as I speak. <laughs> so um, when it moved to the Montauk uh, area, which is at the easternmost tip of uh, Long Island, which is sort of right off Manhattan, they were privately funded. And first they used uh, the money that the Nazis had. And the way the Nazis had collected this money was from, it's really hard sometimes for me to just talk about this in a very nonchalant way because I do get emotional. They, this is money that came from the victims of the Holocaust, all of the people that were murdered. So before they were murdered, you know, th these people, uh, their belongings, their jewelry, their gold, their artwork was taken from them. I mean, like literally taken from them. And then they would be sent off to these concentration camps where they were slaughtered by these very same Nazis that came over during Operation Paperclip into New York some of them went into Israel, some of them went into the United Kingdom, some of them ended up in Argentina and South America. They ended up in many, many places. Some of them ended up working for NASA. You guys, if you do any research for Apollo 11, you'll see that it's a Nazi, uh, it's a couple of Nazi scientists uh, working and Stanley Kubrick, there's a very famous photograph uh, showing this. Some of them were shuffled into the MK Ultra program and they were in fact in charge. And so the money that was stolen from all of the people that were murdered in, in gas chambers, and that includes children, right? That includes a lot of children that were first experimented on and then killed. So um, I'm gonna just compose myself. Um, When they ran out of this money for the program, private uh, corporations, publicly traded corporations and individuals came into play to fund the program. For example, we see that Leslie Wexner and Leon Black funded Jeffrey Epstein. So that we, we can see it, you know, in present day. But back in 1970, in the 70s, because uh, the Montauk project did not close its doors until 1983, was funded um, by IBM. And so when I heard um, on Professor Hamamoto's show, uh, I believe it was Nanny Grossman talking about the Son of Sam killings. And again, I'm not an expert in the Son of Sam killings at all, but I was like, bingo, another, another dot. So I just wanna briefly say that um, Son of Sam murders, and I'm just gonna to try to find because if I can't, I can't use my notes. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna just use the internet, you know. So basically the person that was um, named as the son of Sam murderer is David Berkowitz. Um, and what happened was uh, that there was a crime spree. Um, it began, Okay, the very first uh, murder uh, that happened in New York City happened on July 26, 1976. And uh, the first people that were shot were in Queens, New York. So for those of you who are not familiar with New York City, there's Manhattan 
And I mean, we have five boroughs, right? Okay, so we have, we're five boroughs. Manhattan is sort of considered the city. Queens is a borough. And then we have Long Island sort of on the opposite side. So we have Manhattan, we have Queens, we have Long Island. Long Island is where Montauk is, and it's where Brookhaven was, Brookhaven National Labs, where Jeffrey Epstein, I am 100% convinced, was an MKUltra project. And then we have the Montauk project, where they were taking people off the streets, experimenting, and sending some of them back out. They wanted to create the perfect assassin or uh, the perfect um, Lolita, right? And, and I have described what that is, you know, someone who could lure a man, get compromising information on him. And if he was not willing to be compromised, well, you know, murder him, you know, basically creating a split personality so that to the, to the, to the unsuspecting public, or the person that these people who had been mind controlled to, they could appear normal and likable. You have to be likable, right? Otherwise no one's going to fall for your devious scheme. So for example, Glenn Maxwell was described by almost everyone. Oh, she was a lot of fun to be with. She was trained to be a lot of fun to be with. Jeffrey Epstein, many people said the same thing about him. Oh, he was always cracking jokes. He was trained to uh, present a false front because behind that false front is another personality. That's why the butterfly is um, a symbol of MKUltra because it, it shows a split brain and it shows that there are two sides of, to this person. Um, so what the Montauk project was doing was releasing to test some of these cold-blooded murderers into the street. And so at the same time this is happening, I just want to mention that Hugh Carey in 1975 became the governor of New York. Hugh Carey, I've not released this research uh, but I'm going to be releasing it very soon. And, and again, probably through my Epstein Project newsletter. And if you haven't subscribed, you can do so. It's on my website, kirbysummers.com. Subscribe, but it's only for the paid members. Uh, you know, uh, If I send anything to people who are not paying, it's going to be excerpts. But Hugh Carey uh, was a friend of Jeffrey Epstein. And a lot of people are, don't know that. It's not even like he was a friend, you know, Epstein was a government program. Hugh Carey knew this. Epstein was uh, given an office uh, at Madison Avenue. In fact, one that he shared with Stephen Hoffenberg, who has not been straight with any of the people that he's talked to on any of the podcasts that he's been on who's not been straight with any of the victims, the Jeffrey Epstein victims that he has cozied up to because he too had the same office with Jeffrey Epstein in New York City on the east side on 56th Street. And I know that area very well because I used to go there all the time. But who, did, who else did um, Jeffrey Epstein share the office with? Few people know that Jeffrey Epstein shared the office with Hugh Carey's second wife. What happened to Hugh's Car Hugh Carey's first wife? She was killed in an accident. Sound familiar? There are a lot of first wives that have been killed. If you start looking at, let's say, even Alan Dershowitz, first wife committed suicide. Uh huh. Sue Barlick. If you want to look at Joe Biden, first wife, tragic car accident. But a lot of these uh, first wives and even some of their children um, died. So uh, Carrie's wife died, uh, first wife in 1974. 
1974, this is exactly the same time that everything's happening. It's been exposed. People are running for cover. People are being told what to do. Somebody like Carrie would be told what to do. He's just, he's, you know, he's been in politics for, for, for decades. He's becoming the governor of New York. If you say no, and I really don't know the specifics because I haven't, you know, I wasn't there. I'm not, a, I'm not an eyewitness, but I'm just, I'm just saying it's hypothetically possible that some people said no to certain things and, 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 you know, their spouses and their children were killed. And basically that's what happens. That's what they do. They will do that so that you do what you're told. Okay. Um, so I am of the belief that um, some of the people that were, let's say like, I believe David Berkowitz may very well have been someone who was let loose on the public, perhaps with other people that were also part of his group. That's why it's called Sons of Sam. Uh, there's a Netflix uh, special about it now. And as with all Netflix specials and all of these independently produced shows, uh, the 100% truth is not going to get out, but just a, a sliver of the truth. And then, you know, you think you know the whole story. Um, so uh, he... Um, He eventually received uh, six life sentences. Um, he killed six people. He wounded nine. He stabbed two people in 1975. Um, Maury Terry. Now, I don't know a whole lot about Maury Terry, but I can. Is 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 known for having led the. Research on the son of Sam killings. And so I'm just pretty much, it doesn't say a lot about Maury Terry. It just basically says that uh, it was him and his book were used for the basis for the documentary, uh, The Sons of Sam. Uh, he had a different theory for the Son of Sam murders, that it was a satanic cult of serial, serial killers rather than Berkowitz. Well, I, I just wanna say that um, Maury Terry worked for IBM. And when I was telling you about the private corporations that were funding the MKUltra program in Montauk, it was IBM that was funding them. It was the first company that funded them privately. Not only did they fund the MKUltra uh, project in the Montauk project with money, they funded it with their equipment. And so I found it interesting that Maury Terry worked for IBM. I mean, like literally, he was an in-house editor at IBM and he wrote about the Martin Luther King assassination. That caught my eye. So um, I don't know if, you know, I, again, I, I'm not a son of Sam investigator. I don't know much about Maury Terry other than what I have discovered is that some people will take a hold of a narrative, like the Franklin scandal, for example, write books about it. And we think, oh, isn't this great? We've got this information. This is somebody that we can trust. And, you know, uh, it, perhaps it's misinformation. Perhaps it's meant to draw the eye to something and away from something else. Because, for example, in the Franklin uh, child abuse case, We've heard from Paul Bonacci through um, court transcripts that he was an MK Ultra victim and that the head of the MK Ultra program, the handler, was in fact somebody connected to Ira Rickless, his brother in law. Um, but that information did not make it into either one of the two Franklin books that was written. I've also heard from a victim of the Franklin child abuse case, who claimed that the first guy who wrote the book on the Franklin scandal, and let me just see if I can get his name, um, Franklin uh, scandal books. Um, Cause again, I don't have any of my notes in front of me. Mm. 
but he was also the attorney. He made himself, I mean, there's so many parallels to, there's so many parallels between the Franklin scandal, the attorneys that became involved and the Jeffrey Epstein case. You know, the attorney that, that became involved wrote a, um, a book and the attorney was John DeCamp. John DeCamp was a, a personal friend, come on, a personal friend of Colby. <laughs> I'm sorry, just, okay, so he's a personal friend of William Colby. William Colby um, was the director of the CIA. And before that, he worked with, uh, the Office of Strategic Services. He was in Vietnam for many years. And um, De Camp was part of his Phoenix project. And um, he's a friend of Colby, but he writes his book. So, you know, I did get a heads up from a victim who has never really stepped forward, I think, from the Franklin. Uh, child abuse and subsequent cover-up, because if you go to Wikipedia, it will say that it is a hoax. Just like it'll say that the Montauk Project is a hoax. It will say that the Philadelphia Experiment is a hoax. Well, she claims that she was raped by none other than the man who wrote the, the book and who was the attorney. Uh, so who am I gonna believe? I'm gonna believe the victim. That's what I'm going to believe. And when I, I, I did ask Nick Bryant, who has been trying to become my friend for two years, I always thought it was very odd that, that here's this over 50 year old man, he's single, but he's got this really intense interest in children. And I just, just never understood it. And so there was a little small part of me that um, just until I really get to know someone, I don't really trust them. And so they're like, they're open questions. So I did ask him repeatedly, hey, I, say, I said to him, there's, there's this victim who claims that she was raped by DeCamp, John DeCamp. And so finally he says to me, well, you know, DeCamp was a sex addict, but he's a good guy. And, and DeCamp is the source for a lot of the material that's in his own book, The Franklin Scandal wait a minute, if you're a sex addict and you're in the middle of a, a case that involves perhaps hundreds of children who have been sexually abused, are you telling me that you're not going to have sex inappropriate relationships with some of these children and somehow you're still okay? No, you can't be two people. You can't, unless you're a split personality, uh, which perhaps he might have been, right? De Camp, if he was a friend of Colby, may have been one of these people um, who, who was also a Jeffrey Epstein, right? And we will, as more of these pieces come to the surface, we will eventually get the whole story out. Um, so coming up uh, in my Epstein Project uh, newsletter for Tuesday, I'm gonna be showing you how Jeffrey Epstein was very much like um, Bonacci, Paul Bonacci, who had to go to the White House and had to do inappropriate things with the president of the United States. And I'm gonna explain to you and show you how those photographs that we have seen, you know, I, I was always curious why these photographs were being shown by newspapers that were owned by Robert Maxwell. So they show, it was newspapers that were previously owned by Robert Maxwell, who was Ghislaine Maxwell's father and who died in a mysterious death on November of what, 1991, right? November 5th, was it 1991? He was pushed or fell off his yacht and legend has it as, as well as very well-respected authors have written that it was the Mossad who killed him. So in these newspapers that were formerly owned by Robert Maxwell, 
suddenly all of these exclusive photographs of Jeffrey Epstein and Glenn Maxwell smiling, shaking hands with Bill Clinton in 1993 in the White House surface. Well, guess what? Jeffrey Epstein had been in the White House decades earlier. And I'm gonna show you how and why and who and what was going on in this Tuesday's Epstein Project newsletter. So stay tuned. You know, my, my document here is still, um, <laughs> it's still where I can't really read it. Uh, but um, I'd love to hear your comments. Please leave them for me. I read every comment and I want to thank you for taking a listen. Again, it's uh, Kirby Summers for the Epstein Project podcast. Have a good day. Bye.